I'm Dr. Neil Reddy. Uh, I'm a professor of medicine and a thoracic medical oncologist at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I'm here today uh, with Professor Sharish Gajil uh, from uh, Detroit, who is also uh, an expert in lung cancer. We're going to talk today about some unanswered questions in the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, one of the uh, main questions that we have is now that we have different options in the frontline treatment of lung cancer, how do we choose between them? And, and I think one of the uh, important questions is in the tumors that are high biomarker positive for PDL1. So when more than 50% of the tumor cells express PDL1, do we choose monotherapy with pembrolizumab or one of the new chemo IO combinations or IO IO combinations? Uh, Professor Tigajio, in your practice, how do you approach this? So uh, this has not been uh, an issue until very recently because nivolumab ipilimumab combination just became uh, approved. Um, in the past, in patients with high PDL1, I tended to use pembrolizumab as my default choice. Um, however, in certain patients where I felt the tumor burden uh, was high, particularly lots of liver metastases, lots of brain, uh, uh, lots of bone metastases. I tended to use the combination of chemotherapy and pembrolizumab in these patients. But now we have another option of using a dual immunotherapy of nivolumab and ipilimumab in these patients. Uh, this combination in Checkmate 2 to 7 was better than uh, single agent nivolumab uh, or it was not directly compared to nivolumab, but uh, it showed, uh, the combination showed survival advantage with chemotherapy, but nivolumab, a single agent, did not show survival advantage of, uh, with, uh, compared to chemotherapy, uh, suggesting that there may be an advantage with the combination. Um, however, that uh, question has not yet been answered. There is a trial uh, that has completed enrollment that is looking at the combination of pembrolizumab plus ipilimumab versus pembrolizumab alone, specifically in patients whose tumor PDL1 is high. And that study will truly answer the question as to whether dual immunotherapy provides better benefit uh, than single agent chemo uh, immunotherapy. Moving forward, I think I might still uh, use pembrolizumab as my default choice in patients with high tumor PDL1, um, but may consider combination therapy if I was concerned about combination immunotherapy, rather, if I was concerned about uh, the patient's uh, tumor burden instead of my previous choice of chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all your. Your, your thoughts on that. I think that um, I do like the single pembrolizumab option and the really high PDL1. I think that the, the tumors that are really immune in flame, where the PDL1 score is 70%, 80%, 90%, 100%, have a high likelihood of responding to immune therapy, especially if the patient has a history of smoking. And, and the toxicity of single agent immune therapy is, is so favorable that. Um, I really do find an attractive option. Uh, however, if the patient has a high tumor burden and is symptomatic, I worry uh, about rapid progression uh, because when immune therapy doesn't work, sometimes it doesn't work at all. Um, so I, I do favor a chemo IO combination when a patient has a high tumor burden and is symptomatic. Um, I think that the new Checkmate LA regimen of, of two cycles of chemotherapy plus epilimumab and nivolumab may also be a contender in that area because it does give you some chemotherapy, minimizes chemotherapy, but potentially prevents early progression. Uh, I, think that, I think that that's a really challenging area, uh, but I think we have good options now. So yes. I think another, an, another major issue is how long do we treat with immune therapy? So we've, we've it, it's a great problem to have. We have these patients who've been on treatment for a year or two or more uh, and, and they're tolerating therapy well. I had a patient on one of the early uh, checkmate trials where they said, you know, the trial said treatment until progression or not tolerated. So we get out to five years and I finally said, okay, five years is enough, we're done. 
Um, Dr. Gia, how, how long do you treat patients with immune therapy if they're, if they're having good disease control and no major toxicity? So I have had more experience on the pembrolizumab trials, which, uh, man, uh, which sort of uh, predefined the duration to two years, uh, at which point uh, we discontinued the pembrolizumab. If the patients were on chemo pembrolizumab with uh, pemetrexate, then uh, pemetrexate could be continued beyond two years. So because of my experience of stopping treatment at two years, I definitely, uh, at the uh, time point of two years, have a discussion with the patient about uh, stopping treatment and, and observing them. But I really tailor it to patient's comfort level. Uh, there are some patients who are very happy to have completed that two-year uh, duration of treatment uh, and are happy to be coming every three months or uh, three to four months for assessment and scans. Um, but some patients are very uncomfortable about stopping uh, treatment. Um, my observation, uh, a limited number of cases, highly limited number of cases, is that patients who had early stage disease and then recurred and then were started on uh, chemoimmunotherapy or immunotherapy are the ones who are extremely reluctant to stop treatment uh, at two years um, they because they've had recurrence already once um, there is some data uh, it was not the primary intent of the study uh, a nivolumab study that enrolled about two, 1200 patients uh, and then uh, patients who uh, did not have disease progression were randomized at the one year time point to continuation of nivolumab versus uh, stopping nivolumab at one year uh, and in that study there did appear to be a survival advantage uh, with uh, 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 in patients in whom the nivolumab was continued beyond one year uh, i think the two important issues with the study is that uh, uh, that was not the primary endpoint uh, this was uh, something uh, th that was done after the study had started uh, and was a secondary endpoint but more importantly, there was no uh, definition to continuing beyond one year. That is, uh, it was not clear whether uh, this, uh, in that study, the nivolumab was continued to progression or toxicity. And so it is not clear, should it be uh, forever? Should it be for another year or two years? So at the present time, uh, the way I am uh, sort of recommending to my patients is if they are on the pembrolizumab, uh, treatment either single agent or with chemotherapy, I generally tend to uh, recommend stopping at two years because that's what was, uh, was done in the study. Uh, but I, I am completely comfortable if the patient uh, wants to continue treatment beyond two years. Yeah, I, I agree. I really try to stop patients at two years. And, and there is some data now that for patients who've been on IO therapy and are progression free at two years, most of them are alive and doing okay at five years. So I think that's very reassuring. Uh, so I, I really push people to stop uh, at two years, but some people are reluctant. It's hard. So uh, what about new therapies? What do we what do we see on the horizon? What from from recent clinical trials and ASCO presentations, uh, Professor Gio, what do you what do you think is coming? What what's going to be the next hot thing? So you mentioned ASCO, and it was a very interesting ASCO this year. It was a virtual ASCO, uh, but I think they did a, a very good job. One of the presentations that stood out for me uh, was uh, data with the drug trastuzumab deruxtecan, which was recently approved for uh, her to amplified breast cancer. Uh, but they looked at this, they evaluated this drug in Destiny 2 in non-small cell lung cancer patients with HER2 uh, mutations. There were about 41 patients that were on the study and they observed a response rate of uh, 61% with the median progression-free survival of 14 months. Uh, and these were all patients who were previously uh, treated. And I think that that's a very impressive both response rate and progression-free survival uh, in a, a group of patients where previous agents, including another antibody drug conjugate, uh, TDM1, had shown a median, demonstrated a median progression-free survival of only five months. Admittedly, on the patient population in that study was only 20 patients. 
Uh, and in general, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors such as a fatinib have not uh, demonstrated uh, very high responses. So I, I think this drug uh, may potentially get uh, accelerated approval based on that data and we'll have an option uh, for this uh, group of patients. Um, the other uh, agent that I uh, sort of would like to mention uh, is capmatinib. Uh, this drug uh, was recently approved by the FDA for uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients with CMET exon 14 uh, skipping mutation. Uh, this was based on a single arm study uh, where they observed a response rate of 68% uh, and a median duration of response exceeding uh, 12 months. What is also interesting about this uh, agent is that it did have activity uh, against CNS metastases. Um, at this year's ASCO, data was presented with capmatinib in patients with CMET amplification. Uh, so the FDA approval is only for patients with exon 14 skipping mutations. But in lung cancer patients, you can also observe CMET amplification. And in those patients, uh, the response rate was a lot more modest in the range of uh, 30%. And the median progression-free survival was, a pro was less than five months. So uh, that goes to show that um, CMET alterations do uh, occur in non-small cell lung cancer, but there is some variation in the type of CMET alterations and the efficacy of these drugs uh, may be somewhat different. Uh, but it's important to note that we do have another drug now approved uh, for a group of patients with uh, non-small cell lung cancer. I think that one, one of the targets that I think is really important is KRAS. So KRAS is the most common uh, activating uh, mutation in, in non-squamous lung cancer makes up 25 to 30 percent of uh, non-squamous lung cancer and it's just been a tough nut to crack uh, but now uh, there are at least two agents one from Amgen and one from Marathi that are active against KRAS G12C which makes up about 40 percent of KRAS lung cancers so that means about 10 to 12 percent of non-squamous lung cancer, which is about as much as EGFR mutated lung cancer. Right. So these, these agents that are in clinical trials um, have shown some activity, they're pretty well tolerated. So, so I think there's the potential that these will become an effective option in this area that is um, just up until recently uh, had been a very refractory area uh, for, for treatment and clearly an area of unmet uh, medical need. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, it's an exciting time in lung cancer, uh, a lot of important questions, a lot of interesting uh, new alternatives, either recently approved or, or in, in clinical trials. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Uh, we appreciate your participation. Thank you.